This is System Trader Show, episode number 10. Welcome to System Trader Podcast. Listen to interviews with top traders and find out how the most successful traders beat the markets and what are the secrets of their success. This is System Trader Podcast with your host, Jack Lempart. Today's guest is a renowned trader, Linda Rashke. I had the honor to have Linda already on my podcast in the first episode and I highly recommend it everyone who has not yet listened to it. Linda began her professional trading career in 1981 as a market maker in options. She became a registered commodity trading advisor in 1992. She worked as a principal trader for several funds. In 2002, she started her own hedge fund, which was ranked 17th out of 4,500 for best 5-year performance by Barclays Hedge. Jack Schwager recognized her great talent in his famous Market Wizard series. Since 2015, Linda continues to trade daily for her own account. In the world of professional trading and money management, Linda Rashke stands out from the crowd for three factors – performance, longevity and consistency. Most frequently, when talking about trading, we focus on its positive aspects. Linda Rashke takes a different perspective in this interview, sharing with us market lessons while highlighting the tension between luck, risk and passion. To me, it's an extraordinary interview with an extraordinary person summarizing her great book titled Trading Sardines. It is indeed a 21st century version of a reminiscences of a stock operator. Linda, although being so successful as a professional trader, openly admits how repeatedly got her ass kicked by the market. It sounds so attractive when we can mention how you feel making one million in one single day. Linda, however, puts an accent on being on the wrong side of outliers so many times that it's well beyond the random. Rare events are happening more often than we may think, especially if you are on the market so long as Linda. I encourage you to visit my website at systemtrader.show slash 010 where you can find show notes to this interview. Ladies and gentlemen, Here's Linda Rashke and her great story based on almost four decades of market experience. I hope you'll enjoy the show. Hello, Linda, and welcome to my podcast. Hello. Glad to be here. I'm so glad to have you here for the second time already, as we spoke recently over a year ago in 2018. It was uh, my very first podcast episode at the time. And I can tell you that it's already among the most uh, popular ones. Uh, So thank you so much for accepting my invitation then and now, Linda. I remember you mentioned last time about writing a book, which you cannot finish, and a book about being on the wrong side of uh, market outliers during your professional trading career. And here we go, Trading Sardines. That's your new book. That's your latest book. After so many years since uh, the Street Smarts book was published back in 1996. First of all, Linda, my congratulations on finishing the book. I know it was very hard work for you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know this. It's a really great book and I enjoyed reading it. Uh, it's full of valuable stuff. It's also full of humor, which is just great. Uh, you just proved that traders don't need to be boring and <laughs> deadly serious. So it's, it's really, uh, I like this very much. I have a uh, even seen a statement saying that your new book is a 21st century version of uh, reminiscences of a stock operator. Wow. So I can fully agree with that statement. What I liked, especially about your book, is that it's so honest. It presents so many tough days you had in the past being a trader. Uh, You know, it's easy to just say how successful you are now in the end, but it's much more valuable from my perspective to see deeper how difficult trading craft is and uh, to understand that being so long on the market will put you in the end in some difficult situations which no one could even predict. So, Linda, uh, my first question is, why Trading Sardines? Why a such title? That is actually a uh, story that I heard on the trading floor when I first went down there, and um, so I didn't make it up. It, It came from somebody else, and it's a story about how there's an auction and a fellow gets 
caught up into the auction and, uh, you know, it's for bidding for a can of sardines. And he, he wins the auction and takes the can of sardines home to his wife. And when he opens the can, it's rotten. And, um, he, he's, he's feeling quite cheated. And he goes back down to the auctioneer and says, wait a minute, you know, I, I, I want my money back. And the auctioneer <laughs> scolds him and says, those are, those are trading sardines. They're not eating sardines. And so the moral of the story is that we can't place um, value on the things that we, we trade. Don't assume that something is worth uh, a particular thing. It's just worth what anybody is willing to pay for it at the time. Uh, and that's really a, a problem in the markets for people who think that they know what something might be worth and uh, the market doesn't agree with them. So there's a little moral to that story. Wow, great. Thank you so much for that, Linda. You put in your book a statement that it's never the news itself, but always the market's reaction to the news that is most telling. Could you please explain? Well, sure, because, um, and that's also a, a long time uh, saying, because the you have to assume that the news somehow is priced in by the people that know the news. I mean, there's, you know, I, I'm pretty skeptical that anything's like a total shock to people, but, um, you know, they... The big boys have many ways of, of coming to pretty good conclusions as to what it is. But, for example, if there is positive news, uh, but the market reacts poorly, then that's telling you that everybody's probably already long. And so um, that's going to give you a good indication. And same thing, it's, you know, you know the, the classic adage that the news is all bearish at the lows. So if bearish news comes out, bad economic data, but the market doesn't sell off anymore, and, and it could be any market, it could be the the grains, it could be, you know, um, you know, crude oil, anything, but the market doesn't sell off anymore. Well, it's telling you that the market's pretty much already sold out and there's nobody left to sell. So if the uh, market then rallies on really poor news, it's it's probably short covering and, and, and telling you that there's a lot of cash on the sidelines. And um, so pretty much the way I trade is, is purely technical. It has nothing to do with fundamentals or the news. Uh, but some of the ingredients that, that I include in my models, uh, in addition to momentum measurements, are things like sentiment. And sentiment factors will tell you basically that everybody's long or everybody's already short. And if everybody's already, um, if there's not many people long, that's telling you there's a lot of cash on the sidelines. So monetary measurements are very important to include in longer term models. Okay, I understand. Uh, by the way, are you putting some plant news releases in your calendar so you can be prepared uh, to the uh, for the market reactions? Well, a absolutely. You need to be aware of when the major reports are being released because there can be um, unusual volatility and therefore trading opportunity for a shorter term trader. Um, so, and it can cause dislocations in the market at times. So yeah, those those events are important for me. I think for a longer term investor, they could be ignored. But you know, I'm I'm a trader, not an investor. Right, I understand. You mentioned that people have problems to read and interpret information uh, market shares with us. Could you please some uh, real life example of how to interpret market? For example. Uh, you mentioned something about the market aberrations in your book. Uh, why we should trade in direction of aberration, which, as you as you said, falls outside of the norm. Right. Well, as humans, you know, we feel comfortable with behavior that we know and uh, statistical ranges that kind of lead us a, a little bit of security in terms of, uh, you know, when you're feeling uh, that, that something's of good value, you know, buy wholesale, sell retail. But when there's a distortion in a relationship that we don't understand where it's coming from, our first instinct is to think that something's um, out of line and can be arbitraged or something's out of line and needs to come back into the range that we feel comfortable with. When in fact, um, there's a very strong reason as to why that aberration might be occurring. Um, I'll give you some uh, different types of examples. Uh, for 
example, um, around 2000, the P.E. ratios, the price to earning ratios in stocks hit historic highs. You know, nobody saw P.E. ratios of, of 50 and, and 80. And these were for these new uh, tech companies that were uh, gaining in popularity, you know, the Amazons and Apples and, and um, you know, uh, semiconductors and, and different stocks like that. And uh, it was the market's way of, of saying that the growth opportunity in these was um, amazing. And instead, people looked at the PE ratios and thought, oh, the, the, you know, this price is too high for the stock. Um, and, and uh, you know, didn't believe that it was going up, you know, that high. And of course, you know, they went like, thousand times higher. So that, that would be one example. Uh, another example could be when historic bond yields actually, when the yield curve started to invert or, um, the very first time in my career that I saw 30 year yields in the U.S. drop below 4%. And your first instinct is to think, oh my gosh, you know, these yields are way too low. They can't stay down at these levels, you know, because we've been trading in, in a range of, you know, 7 to 4% for the last goodness knows how many years. Uh, but instead, they dropped below 4%. They actually went below 3% and stayed there for quite a number of years. So these changes in relationships are um, really the market's way of saying there's there's definitely a distinct regime change, if you will, and and they can't be ignored. I understand. Okay, thank you. So we can say that the market is never too high to buy or uh, not too low to sell. Well, that's yeah, that's another kind of... way of looking at it for sure. <laughs> but you know, the right. other important thing is that when you have the aberrations and it is potentially a regime change that will affect your modeling. For example, um, for many years, uh, the, there was an interest rate component that people often included in their models and uh, that became a moot piece of data, you know, for longer term uh, timing models um, because of the Fed's interaction and uh, distortions in the marketplace. Um, So, I mean, I remember the first two decades that I was trading all through the 80s and all through the 90s, the bonds and the uh, S&P, the stock index futures, were about 95% positively correlated because the driving concern at that time was that we were in an inflationary environment. And so if the bonds would rally, the stock market would rally and vice versa. And then that um, relationship completely inverted after 2000 and there was more of a deflationary psychology out there. And uh, to this day, I think that the bonds and the index futures tend to be more inversely correlated. And for a period there, they were 95% inversely correlated. So that was a radical change in a relationship. And, um, you know, you just ne- need to uh, recognize that the market I- is telling you something there. Okay, thank you for that. You said in your book that as a trader, your knack for being on the wrong side of outliers is well beyond the random. Why rare events, black swans or however we call it, are happening more often than we may think? Uh, Could you please tell us a bit about your experiences here? After all, after so many years, you managed to produce an extraordinary track record, although you had so many uh, obstacles on the way. Uh, Could you please just... uh, Tell a bit more about these rare events and black swans. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it, it felt like it was beyond random, put it that way, because, you know, for example, um, I tell stories in the book when I had put on my largest hog position two days, you know, before the outbreak of swine flu, which of course in the US then that meant that the market went down limit for a couple days after that broke and I couldn't get out of the market. That, that, you know, and I hadn't traded the hogs for six months. So why did that happen then? Or the first time that I put on my largest uh, short position in the S&Ps and the Russell, I was like, I think I was short 600 S&Ps and 600 Russell futures. And I put them on the Friday afternoon in the last hour 
before the Fed came out and said that they were taking over Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac during our financial crisis and dislocation. And of course, then the S&Ps gapped up 40 points that Sunday night. So you start to look at a cumulative timeline of how many times these random things happen, you know, from the World Trade Center to Chicago floods. And it, it certainly seemed like like um, <clears throat> I had a lot of adverse gaps against my positions without a corresponding number of positive gaps in the in the position. You would think right. that there would be an equal amount of positive big wins, but there never really were. So in the big scheme of things, if I put it in the context of I probably had made 20,000 trades, you know, over my career and perhaps 12 of them were absolutely horrifying, you know, with having adverse um, event risk against me. Um, it just, maybe it's not significant in terms of the frequency of occurrence. But on the other hand, they do make a, a an impression in your memory. <laughs> so you you remember them much more than, than other trades. And I think that the real moral of the story is your ability to make back these losses and persevere and and recognize that you are in an industry with, e, with risk. It's not just risk in the market movement, but overnight event risk and there's different types of risk. And if you want to be a trader, you have to acknowledge the fact that this is the arena that we're dealing in. Okay, thank you for that. So we were talking about the outliers on the left side of the uh, of the distribution. How about these outliers from the other side? Is there a way to uh, make these outliers to work for us as a traders? You know, I heard a wonderful lecture by Nassim Talib, um, such a fine gentleman that does really interesting work. And he was talking about if you trade stocks or invest in stocks, that, for example, you would not want to be an investor in insurance stocks because of the tail risk there. But instead, if you wanted to put yourself in a position to capture the fat tails, you would instead invest in biotech or pharmaceuticals, um, the types of companies that just need to discover one drug and uh, they can have huge gains. So conversely, when you're trading, um, for example, if you are trading breakout strategies or, um, you know, things where you're going long the, the gamma and, and, and delta, then you are putting yourself in a position of perhaps capturing a bigger win. Um, and as a systems trader, that would be something that would be one of your goals, as opposed to um, developing mean reversion systems, which also have a place in your trading portfolio. But um, you also have to recognize that it is strictly a numbers game. So if you're trading a breakout strategy, um, perhaps maybe one out of every 20 trades might lead to a, uh, a better than a three or four standard deviation move. And, you know, you would want to manage that appropriately. So your trade management strategies for capturing a, a fat tail would be along the lines of trailing a stop as opposed to, uh, you know, taking your profits after a specific target. Okay, thank you, Linda, for that. I would like to ask you about the sophisticated theories and modeling um, and uh, why there's such a difference between theory and academic world and reality. I paid attention to what you said uh, about, for example, quant traders who relying on math continually get killed because the system did not include all the information. For example, arbitrage, which in theory may be risk-free, was able to kill traders, uh, even, very, even the, the Nobel Prize um, winners. So could you please elaborate a bit more on that problem? We like to assume that, you know, we, we feel more comfortable when things behave in a linear fashion, um, you know, straight algebra, you know, that's why, you know, engineers, <laughs> yourself, scientists, right. we like to put, be yeah. able to put things into a, a model, you know, and solve for that model. And um, obviously, it's, it's well known that systems with incomplete information uh, are dynamic and therefore nonlinear, and we can just hit these pockets of uh, 
freak um, price movement that doesn't, you know, correspond with the way that our models would um, want them to. I, I see you mentioned a catastrophe theory in one of your, your questions, and that was something I encountered very early on in uh, reading about um, different types of systems, that the market is, uh, f- does follow this concept of catastrophe theory at certain points. And that's where we're in one type of state um, and the market very quickly shifts to a different type of state. Um, <clears throat> it's a very, uh, it's a dislocation and it's very difficult to model and it has no predictive value. That's, a, that's another thing that people like to think that they can do with their systems is, um, have some type of predictive value. And, uh, it, you can't do that. You just have to recognize that it's truly like a big giant actuarial table, you know, a, a true numbers game. So I, I think as long as you understand, you know, that you are not dealing with a, a linear system, um, some of the more successful modeling nowadays takes a very um, Bayesian approach of one new data point, then you feed that into your model, and then the next data point is going to adjust your model correspondingly as new information comes in. Because when you develop a system or a pure linear model, it's just taking one slice you know one slice of the core there and then you're trying to project off of that and so um i i'm not so sure that the um artificial intelligence models out there um adjust correspondingly every data point going forward but they also can can capture things in a a different um way in terms of looking at patterns. So I think as long as you're aware that this is where the Achilles heel is going to be in certain systems, um, then you can account for that in other uh, ways. For example, having two counter opposing systems um, trading simultaneously, you know, to um, take into account the the holes in in the one system, if that makes sense. Um, you know, it's, it's so many analogies, um, with the trading, you know, uh, uh, in terms of playing poker, right? So, right. uh, you know, you just, you can have five of the top poker players in the world playing. All of them know the math. All of them know equally, you know, the, the numbers and statistics. But how are you going to determine which of those five top poker players are going to come out the winner? You can't because then it really becomes more of a, uh, a a thing of chance, you know, who really did get lucky that time and, and not make any errors. And so you think about we've got a lot of top, very smart firms out there all competing in the marketplace, all with a zillion PhDs, all with their artificial intelligence, all with, you know, thousands of servers grinding away. And when you start pitting them against each other, which is essentially um, an oversimplified uh, way of looking at what's happening, but I mean, how then can you project that there's going to be some you know, linear type of outcome that you can solve for. I mean, erratic things will happen and uh, the noise level will ever increase. I mean, that's why I love the work of Perry Kaufman, who you interviewed, you know, previously, because he was the first, in my opinion, to really comment on the tendency of the markets to increase in their noise level, you know, with uh, more market participants coming in. And that's a hard thing to uh, account for in our in our models is this huge noise level. Okay, thank you for that. Very interesting. How do you then prepare yourself for events which you cannot model as you don't know them yet? Uh, you mentioned, for example, in your book about two major hurricanes within three weeks, uh, which hit uh, your house in Florida back in 2004. The problem you pointed out is that although we have uh, very powerful computers, we have, uh, you know, uh, we 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 still cannot uh, get a hurricane's path <laughs> right for the next um, 48, even 24 hours. But still people, on the other hand, uh, do believe uh, that they can do better in the financial markets. How do you then prepare yourself for events which you really cannot model as you don't know them uh, yet and, and they cannot be just modeled? 
Well, you do have to understand that human nature is one of our cognitive biases is that we are overly optimistic. <laughs> And mm -hmm. everybody thinks that they're better than they are. And everybody thinks that they're smarter than the person next to them. So people by nature tend to always err on the side of being overly optimistic. Whether they, they can model something better or yeah. not is to be debated. But the way that you prepare is uh, several ways. First of all, I think just by knowing that there's risk, you're not, you, you know, you, you are at least going into the arena with open eyes. And then the second, probably most important, important thing is uh, I know too many people that use way too much leverage when they trade. And so um, you have to recognize that uh, whatever your models say in terms of leverage that could be used, um, you really need to use half of that. And, and even these uh, initial equations like optimal F and, and so forth, you will self-destruct eventually if you actually used optimal F in your, in your trading. Um, for those of you that are system developers yeah. and stuff. And I think that's been proven now. But, you know, um, yeah, people tend to be a little bit overly confident. And as long as you can take things down a notch, add different types of diversifications, throttle the leverage, and, uh, you know, find ways to, to manage things accordingly. Okay. Um, so let's continue a bit more about these outliers. Uh, in 1982, when you are just starting your career, you realized a huge loss on options just within one night, uh, over $80,000, which, okay, to give a better context, that was basically, it was just beginning of your career. So it was a huge amount of money for you. Could you please tell us a few words about that story, how it impacted you, how it influenced you uh, as a trader and your trading career? such a such a bad uh, experience it w well it was really depressing <laughs> because now i was <laughs> I, can I was imagine. i was tied to the industry i couldn't leave if i wanted to you know i i i, I signed a, a promissory note that i had to pay this thing back for 5 years because uh, i didn't want to declare bankruptcy and i was the general partner and i owed my clearing firm and um so i didn't really have any choice in in my opinion at the time to leave the business so now I I was, I like to call it in the book, an indentured servant, you know. Um, and uh, so you, I think the next couple years I traded without really making much profit because every dime I made went to pay back my loss. And uh, so then it was a way of also continuing to gain experience, um, you know, forced experience. Um, but on the other hand, I, I will say this, you know, it does a open your eyes to risk. Okay. So pretty much after that event happened, I made it a policy not to short straddles. All right. Because uh, I just right. didn't ever want to encounter that again. So you are um, very mindful about risk early on. And then, you know, you are just aware that there's got to be a corresponding opportunity as well. You know, if you can lose that money, there's got to be a way that you can make that kind of money too. And of course, that took me another 10 years to figure out, you know, <laughs> but uh, at least I stayed immersed in the trading culture and, and um, then eventually went on to the Philadelphia Stock Exchange. And there was a whole nother arena of, of traders there that had different philosophies. So I guess it was about um, 10 years of seasoning after that. You already mentioned about that uh, uh, issue you had on S&P 500 contract in uh, September 2008 about the uh, Freddie Mag and Fannie Mae. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, how to put things in a manageable framework in the case of being on such a massive losing position. And as far as I remember, that was like four million, few millions of dollars just within in a couple of hours. So how to still be uh, conscient what you do and to how to recover from it? Yeah, how to recover from it. Um you know, you you can't look out when you have a substantial loss like that. You can't look out too far on your time horizon because it'll seem unmanageable. So you really have to just focus on 
go in the next day and perform, go in the next day and perform, go in the next day and do your best job. Because it, after experience a big loss, if you think, oh my gosh, you know, I just lost $100,000. How am I going to make that back? I was so stupid. I shouldn't have done that. Um, you know, you have to say, my job is to follow my program and follow my, um, you know, my business plan. And if I do that, then I know that I have this type of positive expectation and it'll take me 30 days to make back that loss, you know, if I don't have any unforced errors. So when you put it in that type of framework, um, you just go in and do your job the next day and just go in and do your job the next day. And the real problem is if you're not a 100% systematic trader, you have to have the mental fortitude to um, not be so stressed out that you can't perform. And I think that it's it's well documented that you do build up um, less react, you're less reactive and less emotional in the markets, the longer you are in the markets. So that's what I mean by having a thick skin. For example, a newer trader, you know, your heart might start pounding when you first, you know, um, make a trade or increase your size, you might get a little adrenaline rush. Um, but over time, you start to get desensitized to all these things. And, um, so then that allows you to progress and and some people i think by nature are more emotional than others maybe they are not going to make good traders i do know that you know people that are adept at game theory such as poker or have you know um excelled in sports um tend to be fairly um mathematically inclined and linear and, and less emotional and uh, and that's important for trading you you need to have a calm even temperament and then that allows you to to continue um because if you're so stressed out at a bad event then you can't trade uh trade with a clear head and if you can't trade you can't make back the money right Right. Okay. Thank you for that. So let's move on the other side of outliers and to be a bit positive because there are also bright sides of trading. And you mentioned in your book also about uh, the case when you made a huge amount of money during one day. Uh, and uh, I don't remember, it was like a million of dollars just in, in a single day. And then when you were returning uh, back home, I just uh, resembled uh, a Pink Floyd song, like there was a, the grass was greener, the light was brighter. Could you share with us how to cope with the other side of the emotional spectrum when we are on the very, you know, we have a huge winning position, for example? Well, you know, it's also pretty well documented that many traders will start to lose money after a huge win because it can be destabilizing in a different way. On that particular experience, I was just commenting on on the endorphins that I felt and and it was just the most amazing feeling. It, you know, it it yeah. uh, it really was. But uh in in the book later I talk about some analogies with um poker and uh also this concept of variance having uh, a large variance in your bottom line can work both ways. So um, if you have a large positive variance, a big win, you also, it might be a good time to walk away and take a little break, you know, because sometimes when you have a big win, it can also lead to overconfidence. And, and that's another cognitive bias that will uh, nip people in the in the bud there. I remember I had uh, uh, Bob Pard on my interview as well, and he mentioned that after a big winner, uh, he decides uh, he decided once when he was running a, a hedge fund to just, you know, take some money off the table uh, because he was expecting that, uh, you know, there will be a worse time just afterwards, and and he was right. But the behavior of people was just the opposite. They saw a very great year, so they wanted to allocate more money. Ah. But that's a different story. Right. Um, do you think that trading on the floor gave you a better mar market feeling? Is this experience uh, you got there on the floor very helpful in the era of 
electronic trading. For example, the emotions, they were very real among real people. And you even said in your book that uh, the word, excuse me, fuck, was commonly used oh, yes. in a million different contexts, a real lingua franca, uh, franca, as you said. How about electronic trading? Can we have the same level of market understanding and feeling? Yes, you can, but in a different way. For example, around the market opening, I could see that people were more excited and more willing to pay a uh, excess price for certain options. Okay, so we see that um, on our screen, but we don't have the feeling from the noise level or, or those types of things. On the other hand, there's a wealth of of data that we have now from the electronic screens that you wouldn't have on the floor. I would say that the best thing that the floor taught me was seeing all around me the examples of the traders that made it and survived in the business and those that didn't because a lot of people come down to the trading floor and they might last three months, six months, and, and then they lose too much money. So it wasn't a guaranteed arena where you're going to make money. So over time, you start to um, notice that the ones who do stay in the business pretty much have a, a, a specific routine, ritual. They're very methodical about what they're doing. Um, they have a per particular strategy that they uh, are trading, a def definite style that they're trading, and they specialize in that. And they're not treating it as a speculative business. So I think that just seeing the example of the people around you, who's who's doing really well and, and who doesn't last, was probably the thing that made the biggest impression on me okay uh, by the way i also like the the floor jargon you had there like opening barge or take the cookies when they pass the plate around or load the boat it was pretty 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 funny so you were using this this kind of language this kind of code on the floor oh it was a wealth of culture and i will say that that is one of the things that has disappeared with the electronic trading on the screen is um uh the culture of the people it was you know it was interesting because just last night i went down to trade stations offices and had dinner with uh, david stendall who does a lot of system testing and larry williams and um one or two other people down there and it was nice to feel that community you know of of camaraderie even though we all do completely different things um it's it's you also know how intense the business can be and how time consuming it can be and, and just, you know, old stories and stuff. So I think a little bit of that has disappeared with the electronic screens. And I don't think that Twitter is the appropriate medium to fill its place. Um, what I do think works for people is perhaps if they find one or two trading buddies and perhaps you have Skype going, if you're a discretionary trader and sitting in front of the screen. I think it's um, not a bad idea to uh, get feedback on ideas from other people. I still think it's important for everybody to do their own thing. But, um, you know, even the telling of jokes during the day helps alleviate the stress a lot on a busy day. Right. Um, being on the floor, you received, uh, let's say, your PhD in trading. And you said that if someone survived, I mean, you said that in the book, for at least three years on the floor, there was a pretty good chance that he or she will be a good trader. Is there any common denominator of those who survived and are good traders? C can you, well, let me can you say, put it this way? Let me preface that and say that just because you survived on the floor, I would say that 90% of the people that were on the floor did not survive making the transition to upstairs. I okay. was on the floor in the options, which was much more strategic and arbitrage oriented. So I was never in a futures pit like the bonds or the S&Ps. Um, those are the people that I think had a very tough time making the transition to the screens because they were trading more off verbal cues from the brokers and the order flow that came into the pits. Um, I would say in general, though, people that are successful in any discipline, be be it uh, tennis, golf, uh, you know, music, um, you know, tend to um, work very, very, very hard, 
um, and they put in an incredible amount of hours. I mean, you could look at golfers and tennis players, how, how they'll go out there and, and practice for six hours a day. I mean, same thing with the piano, same thing with many things. So the number of hours I think would surprise people, you know, that we put in to, um, you know, devote ourselves. Um, and also, uh, every discipline, you have to experience failure over and over and over. And you'll see that. I'm sure that, that many of the professional traders that you've interviewed can tell you stories of, of, of failing, you know, in the first couple of years and having to pick themselves up again and, and then, yeah. you know, learn, having another learning experience. So it's, it's not like you just start off and become a professional trader and, and, uh, you know, uh, make money steadily. It's, you know, even I've been trading now for 39 years and I still have challenging periods where I'm just not on top of the market. So it's just part of the game. Right. I understand. Thank you for that. How to develop and keep confidence? Uh, because it's very important part of the trading to be confident in what we do. But on the other hand, how to be uh, not too confident, not to be overconfident. Uh, because as we know, the, the strongest swimmers uh, quite often are the first who drown. So how to develop confidence? Well, for me, I can just speak for myself. Um, I think that the amount of hours that I have done in modeling and testing helps build up my confidence level for starters, you know, feeling um, like I have a viable framework and structure that I trade around. I feel like I have a concrete methodology that's workable for me, at least, and that gives me confidence. And then the second thing would be experience definitely helps, but probably the most important thing in terms of developing confidence is the preparation you know, the preparation uh, that goes uh, into everything beforehand. And uh, that's what if I haven't had time to do my homework appropriately or spend time at night writing out my business plan and really studying things, I'm not very confident the next day. In fact, there's probably much greater odds that I will lose money. So I would just say that the preparation really is key. Right. I understand. You put also in your book uh, the statement like, correct mistakes immediately and you said even that it saved you literally millions of dollars why it's so difficult to do so if it sounds so simple right just correct mistakes immediately but still majority of traders seems to just fail doing so because we are human we are subject to habits so if you develop a habit of letting a mistake go for an inordinately long time um, and thinking that you'll be able to work yourself out of it then it becomes harder to correct so our brain might know logically that the appropriate thing would be to fix it but our habits tend to control believe it or not 85% of our actions. So it's a difficult thing to break a habit. It can be done. I love the book that Charles Dugan wrote on habits. Um, if you just Googled his name, Charles Dugan, wonderful okay. book. And it's very enlightening, you know, to um, you think that you're in control, but your habits are really controlling you. So it, it just, you know, you just have to do it. Like if you recognize that you make a mistake to say, ah, I'm just this once, just this once, I'm just going to get out, you know, and it may work out or it may not, you know, but once you correct it for the very first time, you're on your way to correcting it in a consistent manner. Okay, but once we develop the bad habits, then what? It's it's not that easy. We know if someone has a alcoholic problem, for example, actually, he will live with this problem till the end of the life. So how to how to cope with this problem? You're right. I mean, I have a problem walking past the kitchen if there's a carrot cake out on the countertop, <laughs> you know, my, my bad habit. I'm not even going to recognize that I'm going for a piece of cake, but my body will go over there and do it. So what they say is that you can never eliminate a bad habit. Never, never. And what the only solution is, is to replace it with something else. So if you know, there was bad food in the kitchen and, uh, you know, I had a temptation to go um, help myself. And by the way, that's why I don't keep food in the, 
you know, bad foods in the house. But, you know, they might say, okay, <laughs> instead of going over and reaching for the cake, get down on the floor and do five push-ups. you know, so you have to replace the action with some mm. other action. So if you found yourself as a discretionary trader reaching for the mouse and instantly wanting to click, if you replace that habit with, okay, first, I'm going to write down on a piece of paper, the price that I see. It's just one simple action that interrupts that hand to mouse to click. Instead, now it's hand to pen right down on the piece of paper. Then if you really want to go ahead and click, go ahead. So um, it, it, it takes a little bit of organization, you know, and checklists to make sure that uh, you have an alternative routine. Oh, very interesting. Thank you for that, Linda. If you would have to teach someone how to trade the way you do it now, um, let's say to clone yourself, do you think it's possible to do it? Uh, if so, how long you think someone would have to spend time on, 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 doing, on doing this, on learning what you do now? I can teach my models basically in a week. I can teach everybody exactly um, my decision-making process. I have a a worksheet that I fill out each night. And over the years, I have had assistants and interns work for me. And I can get them to the point where within just a few weeks, they will put down exactly the same comments that I will. So I know that my work is replicable. And um, most, most of most of my work's pretty simple. So people can get it pretty quickly. What I what I can't teach is what you gain in experience from watching the tape, from watching the price. I can tell people what to look for. And, um, you know, but there's also a lot of filtering going on. Uh, a very simple example might be, I could look for perhaps a momentum divergence to indicate that it's the end of a swing up or down. However, if there's still um, a lot of momentum on the higher time frame, um, that momentum divergence is not going to lead to any type of you know, regression to the mean uh, type of target. It's probably going to get run over. And so learning to process the information is really what takes the longest period of time, much longer than people uh, recognize. I mean, I could teach everybody everything I know within one week. But then they're going to need to observe for probably two or three years before they could process information in the same way that I could. Okay, I understand. Uh, so when you look at your learning curve towards being a very good trader, do you think that you could grow without, for example, reading books or learning some theories or, uh, and so on by simply focusing only on practical exercise, on uh, finding your own way, on just studying the markets only, so without any external influences? Do you think that that would be even possible? Absolutely. I think that's the best way. I really do. I think that um, if you were to print off charts at the end of every day of what the significant turning points look like and start to collect in a binder of what the chart formations look like that led to bigger swings up or bigger swings down. I mean, it could be on a five minute chart, an hourly chart or a daily chart. And you, you start collecting these examples. And after you had 50 different examples, and you had done that by yourself. And then you made an equal study of all the times that it didn't work. And you really start to do um, deductive logic there. Um, I think that by far, that's better than spending your time paying for, you know, any courses or things like that. Now, on the other hand, there's something to be said as well for reading as much as possible, seeing everything that's out there, because one idea might strike a chord with you. I mean, it could be um, a trend following type of idea, or it could be a very short term um, little arbitrage opportunity. There's, there's so many different ideas out there. And that's truly what takes longer than people recognize is finding the style that works for you. You know, you might not want to sit in front of the screens glued, you know, uh, to, to the, uh, to the desk. Um, perhaps you, you might want to uh, pursue seasonal spread trading, 
you know, where you could put on a position and sit with it for a, a week or three weeks and run a portfolio of seasonal spreads. So there's so many different um, areas that you can specialize in this game. Okay, thank you. How much time do you need to dedicate per week for trading activities? I think that the most important thing for me is the amount of time that I dedicate after the market is closed. If I'm just doing my preparation for the next day, um, pretty much an hour is fine. Um, and I try to do all my research outside of market hours as well. So that might be on the weekends or an evening, um, perhaps uh, doing different modeling. Um, I try to do that when the market's closed. So you know, at this point, I've I've done so much, I kind of know what works for me. But I still need really at least 45 minutes um, outside of the market time at a minimum to prepare for the next day. Okay, but then of course, you have, uh, have to also uh, spend your time during the day, I mean, during the session, right? Well, I choose to, you know, I choose to because that's what I enjoy. You know, it's like, uh, you're, you know, it's, it's a sport, you know, it's, um, yeah, you know, I, I enjoy that. It's, it's like, if you're yes. going out and playing tennis, I enjoy, you know, seeing how the opponent's going to hit the ball back and are they going to make a mistake and leave an opening for me? You know, what, whatever game it is, I, I like to see it as a game. You know, I, I enjoy playing cards. I enjoy playing board games. It's an interactive experience and it, uh, I like the focus and concentration. It's sort of a single mindedness. And um, that's that feeling of being in the groove. It's it's a terrific feeling. Uh, so how about holidays, for example? Can you switch off fully from the markets? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I walk out of my office, I completely forget about the uh, the day. I don't want to remember the good and I don't want to remember the bad. I just want to completely uh, get my mind out of the game. Um, so for sure. But then if you miss some very good uh, moves on the on the market, are you then, uh, I don't know how you feel about this. Because, you know, if you are an algorithmic trader and if you are automated, then this particular problem, maybe it's a bit easier to be solved because because you have these algorithms and they make work for you and you don't have to spend maybe so much time for them. But if you are still discretionary, then... And then you go, for example, on holiday, and then you lose a very great move. Uh, what then? No, you I mean, can't think that way. That would drive you crazy. I've I've missed thousands of moves. I can't even right. tell you how many moves I've missed in so many markets. You have to look at it like this: the market <clears throat> is abundant with with opportunity, and it's offering us every week, every month, you know, hundreds of opportunities. And all I have to do is capture two or three of them. I'm not going to capture everything. I'm not going to capture a tenth of everything out there, but, um, you know, it's just offering us opportunity all the time. So uh, if I'm away for a month and I come back, that's fine. I know there's always going to be new opportunities and uh, it's just back to playing the game. You know, you could not play chess 24 seven, you know, seven days a week, yeah. you go crazy. <laughs> Your very first company back in the 80s, uh, when we were talking about uh, when you were in the trading pit, it, by the way, it was called Pyramidin Trading Company, which is just a great name oh for a company. <laughs> um, how your trading experience changed, evolved since then? It's been an evolution of technology. I mean, and it's been an evolution of myself. So, you know, from going on the trading floor to the very first computers that had charting software and the way that we get our data, you know, I used to get it over FM signal, then satellite dish, then, you know, internet and broadband, all the progressions and, um, seeing the way that the software has improved our, our execution software. Software. I mean, initially, there was such degree of latency, you know, when we were first coming out with the electronic trading platforms. And, and now, I mean, everything's down to microseconds. It's, it's crazy. So um, just the wealth of, of information that we have available to us and um, 
So there's been the evolution of technology, also the evolution of markets. I've seen some types of markets fall by the wayside that just didn't make it as a viable product. Um, on the other hand, I mean, goodness gracious, if you look at the options now and you can see these uh, options that trade every two days on the S&Ps and the liquidity in them is crazy. There's more liquidity than ever out there and people need to appreciate that. That's the number one essential ingredient for trading is liquidity. So I think it's a real blessing just the crazy amount of liquidity that we have nowadays. And then the evolution with oneself, you know, uh, times that I tried doing too much and uh, pushed myself out of balance and suffered the consequences, health con con consequences from that. And then, you know, dialing it down a pace right now, I don't, I, I retired as a CTA and a CPO and uh, I don't do hedge funds anymore. It was a fabulous run when I did, but it really was a very consuming lifestyle. And now uh, I just trade for myself every day in front of the screens and I enjoy it. And if I want to leave early in the afternoon to go ride my horses, I can do that. So it's a more appropriate pace for where I am right now. Right. Okay. Thank you for that. By the way, uh, when you wrote about this pyramiding trading company, it, it, it made me laugh because <laughs> I, I, I like this uh, kind of sense of humor you put in the book but also then i i uh i thought that we had the case uh, as my country of origin is poland and uh when the communism collapsed and you know the, the the stock exchange was opened again it was like 25 years ago and one of the first brokerage companies was called uh in english fard which literally in polish means uh luck but oh. uh, the, the guy who who just found out that name he didn't uh, know english probably and he just put it just uh he thought it's just lux but he didn't know that fart in english means oh, what no. it means so that's funny so so then you know imagine these people coming to poland and then they wanted to see how poland grows after the communism collapsed and here we go. We have a big brokerage company named Art. <laughs> Art. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay. Yes. Um, in April 1982, futures contract uh, on the S&P 500 was introduced, and uh, which today is among the most popular contracts. And as you say, you placed your first bid then below 120 points, which makes you, by the way, very proud, which I, I fully understand. I wanted to ask you, how do you see the market changes in the, uh, in the context of this particular contract after 37 years now? Yeah, the, um, well, originally it was $500 a point. And, uh, you know, the trading, the range yeah. then was like 200, 300, 400. Um, and it also traded in nickels. So they split the size of the contract. They then went to the E-minis which were five um, electronic contracts for what would be one big contract. And, of course, right. the average range is so much greater these days. You know, I can remember periods in the past where the average daily range for the S&Ps was like a point, you know, as, as funny as that sounds. Um, but you had 20 ticks because it was all done in nickels. And um, nowadays, of course, you can have an average range of 20 handles or, you know, periods of an excessive volatility of 40 or 50 or 60 handles. And then, you know, there's been periods where the volatility is contracted. So um, definitely you can also be aware of when the algorithmic market making functions are turned off because there are manual overrides for a lot of these market making systems out there that provide liquidity to the market. And they will turn them off when there's unusual uh, amount of uncertainty out there. And during that time, I you can see the um, contract spinning, as I like to say it. In other words, it, it, it'll spin up eight ticks and write back down eight ticks in a very random fashion, extremely noisy. So I do hope that that makes people appreciate the liquidity that many of these um, market-making algorithmic type of functions do add to the marketplace. 
Um, so, yeah, I think the uh, electronic aspect also um, has added a degree of efficiency to the market when there is a breakout. You know, everybody has instant information. Everybody's technically smart. And uh, the markup or the markdown is in a much more efficient manner these days. So there's subtle nuances for sure. Um but, you know, all I care about is that there's good liquidity and, and good volatility. And other than that, if you think about it, the market's either going up or it's going down or it's going yes. sideways. You know, <laughs> nothing really changes. Yes, we have three possibilities. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, but is it still your most favorite, if I can call it this way, most favorite uh, contracts? Um, It is, but I... um. I've gone through periods as well where I haven't traded it as much and I got uh, very much into trading the metals, you know, the gold and silver and copper markets. And then I love trading the bonds. So, and I love trading the boons, the German boons. So I, I, you know, sometimes when there's been really good opportunity in either the energies or the metals or, or the boons, I find myself um, leaving the S and P's alone. Uh, it, it, it depends on the volatility. If there's good volatility, like we had good volatility the last couple of days, I mean, it's a wonderful market to trade because it reads very well. You know, there's so much opportunity and um, different types of information available to us in terms of the market internals that we don't have with some of these other markets. Okay, I understand. So as you said, also, uh we cannot expect that there will be something very new on the markets. We can go up, down, or go sideways. But I wanted to ask you about the Street Smarts book. After over 20 years since it's been published, a couple of days ago, you mentioned on Twitter uh, about the turtle soup in bean oil, which uh, sounds funny, by the way. And uh, But my question is, how such approach like turtle soup works from your experience to what you saw at the time of publishing the Street Smarts book um, back in 1996. Uh, for those who maybe don't know uh, the, or maybe haven't read the Street Smarts, the turtle soup is a strategy described in that book. So Yeah, it was just, you know, that was on a day where I was really bored. I didn't even trade the <laughs> bean oil or something like that. I was just having some fun and I and I saw that. Mm. And and you have to understand that most of the patterns in the Street Smarts book don't have any long term um, objectives or significance. They're commenting on the play that you get in the market's behavior around these 20 day highs and lows. And, um, they just offer a good short term trading opportunity for that day. Now, they may be a more significant breakout and lead to a stronger pattern in the other direction, or it just might be a one or two day wonder trade. It's very similar to Wyckoff's concept of springs and upthrusts, little false breakouts or ways to get the stops and, and come back up. And it's just a, a trade for the day. I understand. Thank you for that. Why do you prefer short-term trading rather than mid- to long-term strategies? Or what do you think about mid- to long-term strategies like trend-following, momentum, uh, long-term momentum, broadly used, for example, by the hedge funds? I think the majority of the money on the hedge funds these days, the ones that have billions and billions of dollars, you would be shocked that the majority of it is on very short term time horizon. Uh, for example, one of the better known hedge funds out there, uh, Renaissance's Medallion Fund, billions and billions of dollars with some of the best performance out there, their average holding time is well under 24 hours. Same thing with Toby Craybell, same thing with a lot of these firms uh, that just are little algo machines. They do not have a long holding time. And if you look at the performance record of the trend followers over, say, for example, the last five years, it's been horrible. Trend following is dead, in my opinion. And the reason is that the noise level in the markets is just too great. 
the the ranges are much broader. So by the time you do get a breakout, it could be later in the move. There's a lot more false breakouts. And uh, as a final kiss of death, the stop levels tend to be wider than ever. So I don't believe that trend following systems and CTAs have near the percentage of assets under management that they did 30 years ago. Um, in terms of why a shorter time horizon for me, um, in general, the higher the volatility level, the lower the time frame that you can trade on. And you always want to be trading at least one time frame above the noise. You don't want to be trading on a level, at least I don't, um, right. where there's noise. And so when there's good volatility, we can really take advantage of, uh, of a shorter time horizon. And then if I can get in and maybe have a holding time of one or two days and be out, um, my overnight risk is lower. Um, I can work my capital more efficiently and I don't have a lot of confidence in being able to predict too far out in the future. I just don't. Um, so, I mean, there's just too many variables that can happen along the way. Uh, it just doesn't work for me. So I don't mind the shorter time frame. Okay. So it's very important to, to uh, put our personality into trading. So we cannot uh, work with the strategy, which is, not working well with our personality as well. There are longer term, there are situations where we can put on longer term directional bets. Okay, for sure, uh, in terms of market timing, when sentiment reaches an extreme and, and you've got some structure such as a weekly buy divergence, um, like we had at the beginning of the year, these lend themselves very well to holding period of one, two, three months. But you also have to recognize that the frequency of occurrence might only be one or two times a year. So that's a big difference. Right. By the way, are you putting stop loss orders when you have uh, some directional positions left overnight? I, when I had my fund and, you know, with the size, you don't have the luxury of leaving resting stops overnight. So, um, in general, no, you know, I would rather trade on lower leverage, but have much wider stops. And usually if I'm carrying things home overnight, there's some profit in it already. Okay, I understand. Uh, could you please uh, tell us a bit uh, about your golf system? You put uh, a nice description in your book, uh, which after all, uh, you abandoned, but uh, you said uh, some interesting words about this uh, in the context of this system that whenever you find the key, they eventually change their lock. But on the other hand, your models, are, as you say, almost identical for more than 30 years time. So uh, how about the system and why you said that uh, whenever you find the key, someone eventually changes the lock? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a big difference, though, between models and systems. A model is... Um, it should be durable and robust, but it's not going to have specific entries and exits and trade management strategies. So right. all of my modeling that I do is without the use of stops, but it tells me where the tendency is and the bias is, and that's why it holds up over time. I can add stops to them, but it will degrade the system some. Um, you know, it still makes it viable, but not where I would want to trade it because most systems do have quite a bit of variance to them, uh, more so than people realize. And um, so the models are strong in terms of an actual system with concrete parameters. Um, a very popular concept would be the system's half-life. And what's happened over the years is if there is a viable arbitrage opportunity where it could be a system the half of life, the half life of that system, the point at which it points to, um, starts to degrade beyond viability is shorter than ever, you know, because you have so many, um, so much money out there grinding out these patterns in a very, um, uh, sophisticated manner. And if there's an edge, it's going to quickly be exploited. So that's really the secret is if you do find an arbitrage opportunity, can you trade it? 
uh, you know, before it's arbed out of the market. So I'll give you just a very simplistic example, a very popular concept, one that I also had included in my program for my fund is a volatility breakout system. And um, Larry Williams originally popularized this. Uh, Bob Buran was a similar system to the one that I did. Toby Craybell, that was one of his main strategies, doing the opening, the, the breakout from the opening range and so forth. So it's a, a strategy in which you're going with the market movement in the hopes of capturing an increase in momentum or range. And what happened is that this became so popular that it became very difficult to move any significant amount of money uh, off of it because of the slippage and the friction, you see. So um, I know Toby fairly well. And over the years, his average profit per trade went from $85 down to $40 down to $18 per trade, which is a very, very small edge just because of the friction you know, of everybody trying to dogpile in at these particular points. And you can see that now with the news and the economic data, you know, the market moves very quickly from one level to the next level with minimal liquidity. So that would be a case where you can see how that system really is not a viable system for a fund anymore. Okay, thank you for that, Linda. Uh, so models give you, as you said, initial game plan, but you need to be um, flexible enough to adapt as the price action progresses. But you still need to know, I, I assume that your models, that they have some edge, that statistically you can uh, follow this bias if it, as you say, uh, um, works well. How do you test that? Uh, how do you know that the, the, the model has some edge? My confidence level comes from having a very large sample size. I have to see a huge sample size. I have to have no more than two variables and maybe one filter so that I know that nothing's really curve fitted. Um, and I want to see that this tendency for price behavior works on multiple markets. Now, not every market trades the same way. For example, the meats are going to have different characteristics than the energies and so forth. But as a as a basic principle of price behavior, I need to have not only the large sample size, but I need to see that something worked in, in different five-year periods. So if I'm testing, I'll either do three-year blocks or five-year blocks, and then I can evaluate, well, was this particular strategy exceptionally good because natural gas had this extreme volatility that made 80% of the system's profits. So it really comes down to common sense. And um, I also try to uh, drop off the, the biggest winners, you know, in a, in a system to see um, if I take off the two biggest winners, you know, how do the statistics right. hold up, things like that. Okay, I understand. But once you have a model, do you want to uh, have this model working in one particular market or do you want to have a flexible model which is uh, which you can adapt into multiple markets? Yeah, I basically keep the same model for every market, believe it or not. Now, okay. they do have their own subtle nuances, but, um, you know, it's just, again, part of having a very consistent process. I understand. Thank you for that, Linda. What is your definition of technical analysis? What, from your experience, has some value in trading uh, using technical analysis? Technical analysis is absolutely the best tool out there for monitoring your risk. That is the number one ingredient. It is not a predictive function. It is there to tell you where the support and the resistance levels are and to monitor your risk. Um, the second most important thing for me, at least, is um, that patterns can repeat themselves. So um, basic chart formations and consolidation levels that then might lend themselves to a bit more trendiness. Um, so in terms of pure measurement of trend and support and resistance and momentum, um, that sort of sums it up. I have a question from one of my listeners also in the context of technical analysis and he asked me 
about uh, Fibonacci techniques and, and to be specific about maybe, you know, Joe DiNapoli techniques. I don't know these techniques at all, to be honest, but uh, he was just curious. What is your opinion on that? If you, if you, if you, if you know these techniques or if you maybe know Joe DiNapoli. Joe's a really good friend and he's been in the business for many, many, many years. And, um, Joe has a wonderful little trick looking for entry when you use a displaced moving average. It's a great tool to uh, perhaps then initiate a trade after you have a double top and, and it breaks through this uh, displaced moving average as a trigger. Now, Joe likes to use Fibonacci to develop pivot points. And, and here's my comment on Fibonacci and pivot points. First of all, there is nothing statistically significant about Fibonacci levels, and that has been proven time right. and time again. The big boys, Paul Tudor Jones doing studies, everybody, there's nothing statistically significant about it. So you can throw a bunch of lines up on your chart, measuring uh, and seeing if there's a cluster, and if you were to actually test, okay, if it comes within one of these lines or cluster of lines within, you know, one or two percent, it's, it's not significant. Um, but the value in something like that, in looking at Fibonacci or traders pivots, or I prefer to look at previous swing highs and lows or a moving average is that when you are monitoring the price, okay, it's very important to watch price relative to another price. That's what tape right. reading is about. It's all about the relationship. And Joe is an extremely experienced trader. He's been in the markets for many, many, many years. So his way of watching a particular Fibonacci level is saying, how close is price going to come to this 31% level or this 50% level or the 62% level or whatever it might be. Okay. And now I'm seeing, is it, is it getting there? Is it going through there? Is it following short? How fast is it getting there? So it's really a strong tape reading tool for him. And it just, it, it gives the read, the um, trader an excuse to add some type of structure to the charts. Now, I don't use it. Um, I personally don't know of any professional traders that really use it that are making consistent living. Um, I would have a hard time seeing somebody like Paul Tudor Jones or Lewis Bacon or, you know, uh, you know, uh, one of these, um, quantitative shops like Renaissance Medallion Fund using Fibonacci. But it doesn't mean that it can't be a viable tool for a person, you know, if it uh, makes them focus on the price action a little bit more intensely at certain points. Okay, thank you very much for this explanation. Very interesting. Um, you mentioned about the tape reading. Uh, could you please tell us a bit more about it? How to maybe start uh, maybe some good books on that topic? Um. Wyckoff wrote a good book. I believe uh, Jesse Livermore had many uh, excerpts on tape reading in his book. Um, you know, all the old classics uh, discuss it in a little bit more uh couchable language because they didn't have computers and uh, software back then. So it was their way of monitoring the price action. And probably the most important thing when you hear this word tape reading, it's not watching every price in the market and every tick in the market. It's more observing the price action around specific areas to see. So when we come down to a swing low, I'm looking at it and I'm saying, okay, is it starting? starting to find a little support here and uh, lose its downside momentum and act a little bouncy and getting ready to reverse. Um, or, for example, if you hear somebody talking about how the tape feels really heavy, well, there could be good downside volume and extremes in the market breadth and high tick readings and a relentless grinding down. Um, so that mm. would be observing the price action. The second thing with the tape reading is it's really about noting aberrations. For example, in the old days, you used to be able to see if there was an unusually large print, you know, a print of 500,000 shares or a gap up. This could be a tape reading uh, note, a particular volume spike or um, some 
some type of price behavior that was outside the, uh, you know, every uh, minute norm there. And then that, again, could be powerful information that the market's telling you. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, you put a very interesting statement in your book that the trader learns a lot by watching how a market absorbs the buying or selling. So can it be also linked to uh, the tape reading? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. If um, in that particular story, I think it was when uh, my husband was executing a bro uh, a trade for Paul Tudor Jones, and uh, Paul used to give uh, Damon his his orders, and uh, he had given him an order to buy a thousand S and P futures. This is probably fifteen years ago, and and Damon executed them within just one or two ticks. And um, when he told Paul the fill, which he felt was exceptional, Paul said. Uh oh, that's not good. And, and Damon said, what do you mean? I did a really good job on executing your order. And he says, anytime I put in an order to buy that kind of size in the market, I would expect it to move the price a little bit. So in other words, what it was saying is that there was so much liquidity at that one price, meaning right. offers that, um, you know, after Paul had finished his, his buying, the market broke rather sharply. Wow, very interesting. Thank you for that. Um, so what do you think ab uh, about the liquidity and uh, about maybe the volume and the tape reading in the context of, for example, a forex market? I mean, the, the over the counter market where we don't have a volume, we don't have an order book, we don't know really this information. I personally don't trade Forex. I prefer to trade the CME futures contracts on the uh, currencies. And I just trade all the majors, you know, the euro, the Canadian dollar, the Australian dollar, the yen, the British pound. And you will find that these markets are so heavily arbitraged that the, the volume will show up equally well uh, in the futures markets. Um, and with that said, Volume in general tends to be highly correlated to range. So if you have narrow ranges, it's probably um, lighter volume 90% of the time. Um, so it's not necessary piece of information, um, but that information is available in the futures markets. Okay, yes, sure. Thank you for that. Uh, just a bit different subject. I get an impression, maybe it's totally wrong, that you prefer to trade on your own account rather than running a business like a hedge fund, although you had, uh, you, you were running a few hedge funds in the past, but is it the reason why you are not running any hedge fund at the moment? No, I, I actually preferred managing money. I loved trading a fund. <laughs> so it's the opposite. I loved it. Yes, I loved it. I loved making my clients money. I loved, you know, proving that I could be better than other people. I loved the recognition that it got me. I felt like I did a really good job and, and I was really good at it. Um, so I enjoyed that very much. Um, and I would just say that after doing it for so many years, uh, you know, I, I I started to just hit hit a little bit of burnout there and it was taking so much time and then the regulatory um, additional burdens got to be excessive, you know, when they kept on uh, changing the regulatory requirements and, and then all of a sudden I'm having to provide all these audited uh, records for each contract and each trade and it, it just got overwhelming and I thought this is, you know, even though I had an amazing team around me, I had an amazing business man manager and and two fabulous right hand people you know i just thought you know it's it, it was running a business it was kind of getting away from the trading just a little bit and i thought you know i've had a fabulous run it's it's probably time for me to take my chips off the table and close down shop and that's what i did okay i understand uh but uh you you are also putting your own capital into the the fund uh, the hedge fund you were managing right so yeah i never believed in in trading an outside private account i never did that i never had my fund and a separate account on the side i okay. mean that almost would have been a conflict of interest i mean if a, if a trade was good enough for my own account why wouldn't it be good enough for the fund and um it worked to my advantage because i put all my money in the fund and i put it in the fund we had a two to two to one leverage class of shares. 
So my money was in there double on the fund. And, and the clients really like that. You know, the clients really like right. the fact that I had my money where my mouth was there, you know. And, yeah. and then I never saw my money, you know. It was just an abstract thing. I never looked at my account balance. You know, my business manager kept all that. And, um, you know, it was really a good thing, um, you know, that I just saw the performance for the fund, you know, how much we're up or down on the month. And, um, you know, and then over time, you know, with the, with the compounding, because I always did my sizing, my position sizing in terms of a unit size. So if I'm doing X number of contracts for a million dollars, then if I had $10 million or a hundred million dollars, you know, my unit size would increase 10 times or a hundred times. So I'm never think I'm always working my money in a very proportionate manner. I understand. Thank you for that, Linda. Uh, you say that a good trader does not need validation. Uh, what really matters is that you can pay your bills. As a CTA, while you were managing other people's money, uh, running hedge funds, you mentioned uh, some terrific returns like uh, 70% of the fees in one year. On the other hand, you also, as far as I remember in your book, you mentioned that on your private capital, I mean, when you were not running a, a, a fund, you, you were able even to, to get a result like 200, 300% per annum on your private, private account. I know that you don't like putting things uh, this way, as it all depends how much capital we trade, how much we keep aside, right. what is our situation, right. do we have kids, mortgage, and so on and so on. But from your point of view, what is the realistic uh, realistic profit we can make uh, per year out of trading, short-term trading? Again, you're back to that evil little, um, you know, thing of statistics. You know, if you have a $10,000 account and you make $10,000, you could say you made a 100% return, but you're not going yeah. to get that same return on a $100 million. Um, I think that it is realistic for a trader with, say, $50,000. I wouldn't suggest trying to make a living with trading capital of less than $25,000. Um, I think that you'll start to feel too much under the gun and you might not be able to trade well if you have a drawdown. I do think, put it this way, if you could trade nothing but four E-minis every week, okay, that's a pretty right. small amount of margin that you're using to trade four E-mini contracts. And let's say that that's the only market that you're trading, I, I would say that there's absolutely no reason as to why with concentration and consistency, you couldn't average 500 to $1,000 a day. Okay, of course, you're going to have losing days and make mistakes, but you might have a day where you catch a piece of a trend and you make $5,000. You know, it's very possible in, when, in good volatility. So I do think it's very realistic to say, that a consistent, focused trader could do four e-mini contracts um, and make four or five thousand dollars a week, which really doesn't sound like much. Um, but you have to also allow for the fact that you're not going to be trading every week. You might take a couple weeks off. You know, you might have a bad week, um, and and so you could put it in a really realistic um, context. Now, how much money do you need in your account to do that? Um, some people might feel more comfortable with a bit of a cushion, you know, um, other people are just like, Hey, let's go for it, you know? So it's really a personal thing. And of course, you know, you've got people that day trade stocks or position trade stocks and options. It, it, so it's, you know, it's possible. I think that you'll do best if you eliminate the distractions. You're not going to make a consistent living, I feel, when you're sitting there trying to follow people on Twitter and, and blogs and, you know, have the TV on in the background. I mean, you really have to look at it like you are concentrating on that golf course, trying to make that final putt on the 18th hole, and nothing is going to rattle your concentration. You have to be that focused. Uh, and then it's, anything's possible. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, by the way, regarding the distraction, you are very also skeptical about uh, of anyone who brags about the trades or profits. Um, to me, you are more like a 
poker player. You mentioned already about the poker, and uh, as far as I remember, your 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 brother uh, is also uh, involved in poker, and and you saw there some similarities between this between the poker and and trading. But why you are so skeptical about just being, you know, I saw it on the trading floor for years. I saw it with the people who were making money and the people who only lasted a short period of time. <laughs> you know, that's all. I'm looking at all the examples I've seen over my life. And and the people that were making the most money, you'd never have any idea. They didn't talk about it. They didn't brag about it. You know, if anything, they would whine about their losers and, you know, whine about how right. they got, you know, a bad fill and things like that. And meanwhile, yeah. you know, they'd be making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. I I think that um, ego is a very destabilizing thing in the marketplace. And you'll find I, I'm very suspicious of, of things on Twitter because uh, I, I don't use it and I don't look it up, but I have looked at it uh, a couple times. Um, and I see... Um, I see people commenting about 90% of their winning trades and nobody ever says anything or revisits <laughs> a losing trade. And I know the markets don't work that way, you know. So I right. think it, it boxes you in the corner, you know, to um, talk about your P&L or your trade because – it's not going to be like that forever. If I have a, a particularly exceptional month and I make 10% for that month, I know I'm not going to be making 10% every month, you know. So to try and project out in the future, um, you know, would be a fallacy. Uh, and, and then that will actually destroy your confidence. It'll come back to haunt you that you can't maintain that uh, streak of wins or that level of consistency. So, I, I mean, I'm sure there's a few people out there that can get away with that, but you certainly don't see the big boys, you know, that have been in the business forever and ever talking about their returns or their performance or one big win. You, you certainly don't see that. <laughs> right. Uh, Linda, how long do you think uh, you will still trade? Uh, do you have any plans? Uh, do you think maybe that trading is also a good brain exercise, which helps you to be in good intellectual shape? Oh my gosh, you are so right. You are so right. I mean, there's something new and interesting happening every day. I'm always learning about stuff or reading up a, you know, some ticker tape that, you know, company that flashes across the tape. And I'm like, wow, I've never heard of that company. What is this particular company? And, and I can look it up and see what they do and, and learn about a whole different field. Um, yeah. So I, I do think it's any, um, any brain exercise, if, if it's music or writing, you're keeping yourself active mentally, you know, as we grow older is, is really important. Um, and it's, you know, I mean, for now, I like the game. I mean, there might be a period in the future where I want to travel a little bit or, or do something else. But uh, I mean, it's what I know, you know, and I think people are happiest doing uh, what they know. And it's also your passion. So Oh, it's trust me, I have you. a love-hate relationship with the markets like everybody else. <laughs> I mean, there's days where I hate the market too, or maybe I hate the actions I did. <laughs> but you always return uh, to, to them. It's after a sick time. addiction. <laughs> what can I say? I'm addicted. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, we are reaching to the end. Uh, just a few final questions. What are your favorite books? Or maybe you have some favorite researchers, traders? I love all the work of these old timers, the original Wyckoff material, Schaubacher. I mean, if you read any of the authors from 60, 70, 80, even a hundred years ago, because they right. saw things with a, a unique framework, you know, where they didn't have computers and they're, they're seeing the essence of the price or people's behaviors. And, uh, there's just a, a certain wisdom that resonates from those writings that you don't really get in the dry technical uh, writings of, say, a, a quant manual. It's a, it's a different thing. I like the culture right. of the industry from many years ago. I hope it doesn't get lost. Okay, okay. I will put all this uh, to show notes on my website. Uh, are you, by the way, planning to write some books in the near future, maybe? <laughs> Oh, That's yeah. very funny because, you know, <laughs> I've had six books outlined for over 15 years. Uh, literally, I've, I mean, I've had a book that I would like to rewrite the 
Taylor trading technique. I have an okay. original trading manual that I wrote 20 years ago. I would love to do this. And so when I actually sat down to write, um, a completely different book popped out. I, it sort of surprised me what, what came out. And it wasn't anything that I had outlined um, from the past. Uh, I'll just have to say this. It's, it's very difficult for me to write and trade at the same time. So if God made 40 hours in a day, I would absolutely um, write more. But, uh, may, you know, I'll see how this goes. Maybe there'll be a point on in the future where I want to take a little hiatus from, from trading and, and, and write. But it's really hard for me to write. I'm, I'm not a natural author. So we'll see. But your books are very, very good, and and people because are... I had to work really hard at it. <laughs> it didn't come easy. Uh, Linda, thank you so much for your time. It was a big honor for me to have you here today on my show. I appreciate uh, very much that you dedicated your free time during the weekend. Uh, just yesterday, I got an email from one of the podcast, li podcast uh, listeners who was asking uh, how long he needs to wait for for this uh, interview. So people really like and appreciate what you have to say. Is there anything you would like to add to our conversation before we finish? Oh my goodness, you covered so many topics, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, was... I would just say that anybody that wants to buy my book right now, you're not going to find it on Amazon. You have to go to my website, lindarashke.net. So, um, and and then, uh, you know, maybe one of these days I'll, I'll convert it to a, an audio book or an ebook or something. But uh, no, I just, uh, I hope that I get to speak with you in the future and I wish you the best in your own pursuits. Yeah, thank you very much. By the way, I was about to ask you about this uh, electronic version of, of your of your book, uh, because I think that for some people who are living on the other side of the world, it could be maybe easier to to, to buy it and not to wait uh, longer, but uh, it's worth to wait. I will eventually, maybe a year from now, and okay. I've had a lot of people say that if I could convert it to an audiobook, perhaps where I read the whole thing, that, uh, would, be that would be a worthwhile venture too, but uh, right now I just need to to regroup and catch my breath, you know? <laughs> and, and I'm really proud of having a physical book. There's something nice. I mean, yeah. my best books, they're on the library and I can pull them down and feel the pages. And Maybe I just want to go back and read a certain chapter. And, and I've got wonderful pictures and charts. And, you know, I really made an effort to get the highest quality binding and the highest quality paper. So to me, it's a little bit like a, a work of art as well right now. I understand. So, yeah. I understand. Yes. But I encourage everyone to read your book. Uh, also, I will put uh, the show notes on my website, systemtrader.show slash 010. So uh, also lindarashki.net. Uh, there are all the detail details you need to know about Uh, book how to uh, get your own copy thank you very much linda for your thank time you. it was a great pleasure and have a good day thank you very much I'll, thank uh, you bye bye